I thank you so much for inviting me to this excellent, I mean, it, it, it's an incredible event. I really enjoyed uh, music yesterday, and uh, as far as I know, I think this is really one of the kind of events that I have actually, it, it's the first time for me to attend this kind of event, to be honest with you, even though I have been working on Hokkaido for some years. So it's really, I'm, I'm so honored to be here, and thank you so much for inviting me. Okay, so let me get started. When we think of Hokkaido's 150 years history from the perspective of settler colonialism, we must ask the following question. What are the distinct characteristics of the modern form of settler colonialism that shaped the history? My main argument is that it was the notion of terra nullius, that means nobody's land, un un unoccupied land, a notion that was premised on the Lockean theory that those who cultivated the land with their own labor had the right to claim the ownership, the ownership of the land, marked a decisive break between the early modern form of settler colonialism and its modern counterpart. This conception of private ownership, based on the notion of cultivation, served an ideology that legitimized the Ainu people's dispossession, that is, the expropriation of their land by the Meiji government. Through this process of dispossession, the Ainu people were transformed from exploitable labor to disposable population in their relationship with the Wajin. What this transformation implied for our understanding of settler colonialism is crucial. With this transformation, eliminatory impulse, which is a defining feature of settler colonialism, deepened and intensified. I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm not going to follow all these points, but as you, as you listen to my presentation, please just take a look at all these uh, points that I'm kind of extracting from my uh, uh, talk. Okay. So as Patrick Ouf and uh, Lorenzo Verasini and others have incisively argued, the logic and structure that drives settler colonial policy is not exploitation, but elimination. Ouf argues, the primary object of settler colonization is the land itself, rather than the surplus values to be derived from mixing native labor with it. Though in practice, indigenous labor was indispensable to Europeans, settler colonization is at base a winner-take-all project whose dominant feature is not exploitation but replacement. Neither the Tokuma shogunate nor the Matsumai clan attempted to systematically replace Ainu with Wajin settlers or took the elimination of Ainu community as the precondition for their economic gains. Indeed, they depended on the over-exploitation and the forced labor of Ainu people. For example, Matsura Takeshiro, that I just mentioned, who traveled from 1844 to 1858 in Ainu Moshiro and became closely involved in, with the indigenous people, visited, uh, visited Nibutani in 1858 and expressed a grave concern that one third of 111 Ainu villagers all of whom were men of prime age, were taken away by the Wajin merchants to perform forced labor for sardine fishing, and only elders, women, and children were left in the village. Matsuda noted that those men are confronted by harsh working conditions and were not allowed to leave the workplace without the permission of their sub supervisors. In short, what I would like to argue in today's talk is that Tokuma Japan's aggressive intrusion into southwestern Ainu Moshiro certainly undermined long-established Ainu communities in the region, but it was not until Meiji government applied, no, it, no, it was not until the Meiji government applied the concept of terra nullius to displace Ainu and expropriate their land that eliminately impulse became the dominant feature of Wajin's policy towards Ainu. The Meiji government distinguished itself from its predecessor by rendering Ainu Moshiro as an empty or virgin land thus negating the Ainu's presence and mode of living as redundant for the making of the modern world. Ainu Moshiro became a Japanese borderland that defined not only northern limits of the nation's sovereign territory, but also rich reservoir of natural resources for capitalist industrialization. Major settler colonial policies revealed a distinct logic of national capitalist formation grounded in expropriation of the productive forces of natural world. They simultaneously converted the indigenous inhabitants into remnants of the prehistoric past, 
a living fossil with no relevance in a world dominated by the requirement of capitalist accumulation. Thus, the only way for indigenous people to escape the fate of elimination was to renounce their established ways of sustenance, the given form of labor, and their relationship with nature. That is, to become a farmer, as the former native protection law of 1899 forcefully stipulated by reorienting their lives according to the modern conception of labor and land ownership. Otherwise, they would be abandoned to bear life, an imminent danger of death as a person who was unworthy of living as a member of Imperial Japan. As I indicated earlier, Wajin's aggressive intrusion into Ainu's world began much earlier during the Tokunga period. In the early 17th century, Matsumai clan was authorized to control all the Wajin settlements in southwest Ezo. They built a small castle in the town of Matsumai and started setting up trading posts. Matsumai gave their loyal vessel the exclusive right to operate the post, allowing them to facilitate the lucrative trade in rice, cotton, and artifacts for dried salmon, herring, and kelp. And Shogunate granted Matsumai the privilege to limit Ainu's trade only to these posts, as the vessel steadily turned over the business of trade to well-established merchants, mainly from Osaka, but especially to traders from Omi near Kyoto, the merchants quickly transformed, transformed their voluntary <coughs> trading relationship with Ainu in, into coarse coffee labor. From the mid 18th century on, as Matsumai put increasing pressure on the merchants to yield more profit from the trade, iron working conditions in the fishery, fisheries worsened and Wajin's unfair and deceptive trade practice became commonplace. Dishonest merchants traded sake to the Ainu in barrel with false uh, bottoms and diluted the sake with water. They encountered the Ainu to drink in order to cheat them more easily, and Matsumai authorities prohibited Ainu from raising crops and buying seeds. The prohibition of farming kept Ainu dependent on trade for rice for their own consumption. Some historians consider this process Wajin's encroachment in southern part of Ainu Moshur and violent subjection of Ainu in exploitative trading relationship as an exemplary case of settler colonialism. I agree with this assessment to the extent that the uh, process created Japanese settler communities in Ainu Islands and transformed the Ainu people's social relations of production and mode of livelihood. However, however, to decisive feature of settler colonial formation, namely systematic disposition of land and systematic <laughs> demographic replacement or elimination were not part of the Matsumai's intentional colonial policies. As I argued, this eliminatory logic became a distinct feature of modern form of settler colonialism which made Japan's drive for nation state building and capitalist development. Language like Teranurius and Virgin Lands worked as a colonial tool to justify total expropriation of Ainu's means of sustenance and the fundamental negation of the relationship with natural environment. These strategic idioms drew on United States policies for the American West. The narrative of wide open spaces in the West just waiting to be filled by enter enterprising white settlers underwrote U.S. homesteading policies and made uh, westward expansion a kind of nationalist moral imperative. The Meiji government implemented a similar set of colonial strategies, starting with the same linguistic moves. Indeed, Horace Kaplan, working as the chief advisor for the Meiji government's colonial policies in Hokkaido, called Hokkaido a virgin land and proposed in his 1872 report a Japanese version of his country's allotment and land redistribution policies for Indian territories set out in the Homestead Act of 1862. By urging the Meiji government to adopt settlement, quotes, settlement on liberal terms offered by the government of the United States as a means to spur the speedy occupation of Hokkaido, end quotes, Kaplan proposed that that program of public land grants to small farmers should enable each settler in the new frontier, quotes, to become bona, fi bona, fide, a bona, bona, bona fide, bona fide owner of the tax of 160 acres of the public domain without cost, except the payment of $10 to the land officers of the district, end quotes. 
The translation of Aino's heterogeneous world into familiar colonial idioms marks the decisive moment when brute force of dispossession came to signify the positive value of opening, or kaitaku in Japanese, in the name of supported, uh, supposed civilizational development and progress. Once this inscription gained legitimacy in the public discourse during the 1880s and 1890s, the colonial logic of civilizing mission meant the Ainu's practical and conceptual world soon came to signify backwardness to be effaced from the earth. By the, by the 1900, the social relations and values that sustained the Ainu community were commonly rendered as direct cause of their displacement and deprivation. The Japanese government argued that Ainu's uh, struggles and properties were due to their own innate inability to understand the concept of private ownership and learn the new way of life beyond primitive hunting and fishing. In the government and the popular imagination, the Ainu came to be regarded as a weak ethnic group destined to die out according to the universal law of social Darwinism because they could not compete with the Japanese or develop the frontier. Furthermore, Japanese intellectuals, educators, and policymakers all agree that the only means by which Ainu people could ensure their own survival was cultural assimilation. In 1871, Kuroda Kiyotaka, concerned with Concerned with, um, sorry. concerned about Russia's push eastward, visited the United States looking for a leader in initial exploration of Hokkaido. On President Grant's recommendation, Kroda met with Horace Kaplan, who served in Grant's administration as a commissioner of agriculture, and successfully persuaded him to accept the appointment as special advisor to the Japanese government. It is quite likely that Kaplan's earlier experience managing the forced removal of Native American from Texas to new territories after the Mexican-American War appealed to Kroda and his government. Kaplan remained in Japan from 1871 to 1875 with a singular task, quotes, find the best way to utilize the resources of Ezo for the material enrichment and elevation of Imperial Japan, end quotes. During his first touring in Hokkaido in 1872, Kaplan became convinced that because of the climate and vegetation that was similar to northeastern parts of the United States, Hokkaido would be an ideal place to adopt American farming methods. He wrote, so I have a long citation, actually, I'm sorry. It's long citation, oops. Sorry. Yeah, here. So I'm not going to read it. Um, please just take a look at it. So he's really comparing so the constant United States and the Japan, uh, Hokkaido, and then came to the conclusion that, in fact, we can, they can really sort of implement a very similar sort of agricultural policy in Hokkaido, uh, modeling after the American experience. And actually, uh, based on that proposal, uh, notion of Hokkaido, they, he came up with all kinds of proposals uh, for transforming Ainu Moshu, Moshu to, uh, into a, some kind of um, kitchen for Japan, where they can produce all kinds of agricultural produce for the modernization of Japan. And I'm not going to read out all these uh, points that he made, but I think I'd say that the very last one, the number seven, where he talked about, you know, they should actually bring, especially American foreign, American farmers to Hokkaido so that they can set a kind of example how it's like to cultivate the so-called frontier. But this is a point that Meiji government refused to take. Probably this is the only point among the seven points that Meiji government refused to take because they're worried that um, it's going to be a virtual colonization of Hokkaido by the Americans. Um, okay. Although Kroda himself was very, very enthusiastic about this idea. So on the heels of these recommendations, Kaplan and his team set off on the tour of Hokkaido in 1872. During the expedition, Kaplan wrote, Ezo is a wonderful island but its true value has not been sufficiently appreciated. It is rich in mineral resources. Its fishery is unlimited. Lumber has excellent quality. Agriculture has unlimited possibilities. It could easily provide for several million people. Then he added, the resources and climate of this island have been misunderstood or misrepresented, at least to me. If natural products of the soil are any indication of its fertility, this island will compare favorably in these respects with some of the wealthiest and most populous portion of the United States." End quotes. 
The Japanese settler colonization of Hokkaido was thus outlined and facilitated by the joint forces of the Japanese state and the United States experts on technology. Japanese leaders focused on the occupation of Hokkaido through the systematic migration of former samurai lords, samurai retainers, and ordinary citizens, in particular displaced farmers and peasants. From the 1870s to 1880s, by supplying them with free land and financial support, while counting on American export, e experts who offered various technology of colonization to reshape Ainomoshiro into land suitable for Japan's capitalist modernization. The new policy did not directly benefit working class settlers, but the development of infra infrastructure and commerce and the establishment of banks in 1896 and 1899 stimulated rapid urbanization in the southern part of Hokkaido and brought a new wave of mi migration to major settlements such as Hakodate, Sapporo, Otaru, and Kushiro. In 1901, a new 10-year development plan announced the construction of more bridges, roads, and railway stations. The number of incoming immigrants began to surge after 1900 from 50,000 to 80,000 annually, leading to accelerated colonization of Ainu land. In 1909, the Japanese population of Hokkaido reached 1.5 million. Okay. So um, this is a kind of demographic change um, that took place uh, in terms of Japanese and Ainu population. Okay. And as Anne explained, actually, the demo you can see the democratic pop dramatic demographic change in terms of Ainu population prior to um, the uh, major government colonization. And th this is something that she talks about, and it's a very important aspect that we have to consider. Okay. Now, I'm not going to talk about all these policies, but I just listed the very important economic policies that really resulted in dramatic dispossession of Ainu people. Okay. And maybe I should just mention the very last one. 1899 is a very famous sort of former native uh, prote protection law in fact, uh, they, the Japanese government claimed that they're going to, they, they actually made a reserve for these Ainu people so they can turn into farmers, right? The precondition is that they have to become farmers. They have to be renounce hunting and gathering as a way of life. But actually, you can see only 0.01% of the land was allocated to Ainu people, and that even piece of land was not fertile enough for them to actually make a living as, as farmers. Also, I have to note that some Ainu people, of course, successfully became farmers, and then they began to, you know, um, land their own farm. But, you know, majority of them had a hard time. So many men actually went back to the fishing industry, and they eventually they became a sort of employed laborer for fishing industry or farmland. Okay. All right, so I've just skipped this part, and I just jump to the conclusion. Okay. What the, story of Ainu, uh, what the story of Hokkaido's settler colonial experience tells us is twofold. Japan's modernization project was colonial from the very beginning, and this colonialism's idea and practice were trans-Pacific, shaped by frontier politics developed in the United States. It comes as no surprise that Ainu people came to be called by the 1910s a vanishing race, similar to Native Americans and Australian Aborigines. This pejorative name naturalized a historical process of their, their disposition, impoverishment, and near extinction carried out through government, settler colonial, and develop, developmental policies. The rationale that only those who cultivate could claim ownership of the land gave birth to the modern conception of property and thus um, foundational ideology of capitalism and in turn negated the indigenous people's relationship with land, water, forest, as redundant and even illegitimate. Ainu people's struggle for social and economic injustices continue into the present day. Despite the Ainu people's repeated appeal for a century, Japanese government has not recognized their sovereignty in Hokkaido, nor has Japanese society overcome the prejudice and discrimination against Ainu, which originates from massive ignorance about Japan's settler colonial history in the island. Kaizawa Tadashi, a late Ainu activist, contended in 1991 that the history of Hokkaido had always been written from the perspective of the conqueror, the Wajin, while Ainu Association protested a decade earlier that the Japanese people must be made aware of the history of Ainu's dispossession and displacement. This is a quote. 
You must learn the history of the Ainu because Japan's modernization ascent to a civilized status were achieved through the oppression and exploitation of many other ethnic groups like Ainu. Japanese people felt perfectly fine exercising such violence against us because they regarded us as an inferior race that would eventually die out. Their greed for resources and their dis destruction of our community lives like <clears throat> communal lives have been all forgotten. End quotes. As we reflect on the 150-year history of Japan's settler colonization of Ainu Monsieur, it is imperative to remember that the settler colonial past retained a strong claim on the present, and that claim should not be taken lightly. Thank you. Thank you.